Everybody knows the classic ROM hacks like Radical Red and Renegade Platinum, right? I've always been interested in the idea of a difficult Generation 6 hack, one that really challenges me and brings something new to the table. The Gen 6 games are pretty widely considered to be the easiest in the series, but Ancestral X is a completely different beast. Created by Axon, this game adds a ton of type changes, difficult fights, and variety of encounters. And I set out to attempt a hardcore Nuzlocke of this new game, and it's been super refreshing. Ancestral X starts as any Pokemon game does by choosing your starter. The three options in this game are of course Chespin, Fennekin, and Froakie. From the people I've talked to that have been trying to hardcore Nuzlocke this game, Fennekin is apparently the worst, but that's never really stopped me in the past, so I decided to go with the Fox as my starter. The cool part about this game is that the middle stage Kalos starters get their final evolutions typing, so Bryxen is already a Psychic type by the first gym. I pick up a few encounters, including a guaranteed Swab Blue that's a Fairy and Flying type. Most of the pre-Gym 1 trainers in this game are pretty straightforward, but on Route 22 there's an entire route full of demons. Like this Butterfree trainer is actually crazy. Compound Eyes Butterfree with nearly 100% accurate sleep batters that outspeeds your entire team. Anyway, I beat all of them and fished up a Gumi as my last encounter before heading into the gym. Yeah! 20! Guardian Viola's gym is a double battle with Roller Skater Rinka, which is actually a little bit scary. I ended up beating her as well as the only mandatory gym trainer and I started the prep for the first gym. Viola's team isn't too scary on paper, but she actually has a lot of coverage across these puny little insects. The Vivian in particular is pretty brutal as it also has compound eyes, giving it nearly 100% accurate sleep batters. I fixed up what I thought was a pretty solid team and took on the first gym leader. Viola leads with Dwebble and I choose to lead with Barboach. This Dwebble has a rocky helmet set with sturdy and counter, so I wanted to avoid using physical moves on it. Two water pulses knock it out, bringing in her next mon, Surskit. Like I said earlier, these bugs have coverage. I have Vivian take the incoming Giga Drain and get some damage with Gust as Surskit sets up rain. I want to avoid dealing with rain as much as I can, so after stalling a few turns with Gumi and Vivian protects, I eventually take it out with another Gust. Swadloon comes in for Ancient Power, and I'm hoping it doesn't get the 10% Omni boost on my switch to Krogunk. Krogunk pulls through and taunts the Swadloon as it tries to use Grass Whistle. My Froggy resists all of this thing's moves and slowly finishes it off with Poison Stings. Krogunk at this point is low enough to bait more than one move from the incoming Vivian, and I switch in my starter to try and fight it. Chesterberry shakes off the Sleep Powder as I chip it with Incinerate, and again with Psybeam as I hope to snipe some damage on her Lurvesta as it comes in for Flash Fire. Viola chooses to keep her Vivian in, and I switch my own Vivian in on a Sleep Powder, again holding a Chesterberry. I outspeed and barely don't knock it out with a Gust, and it hits through Confusion landing an Electro Web, which doesn't lower my speed thanks to Shield Dust. I take down her Ace and in comes her little Joltik. I decided to let Gumi get involved, but this thing kind of sucks, and I ended up switching it out for Barboach, who takes care of the spider. All that's left is her Lurvesta that has a terrifying flame charge set with a Focus Sash. I switch into Swablu, who's still full HP for a Sing. My only real strategy here is to hope it stays asleep for long enough so we can kill it through the Focus Sash, but it wakes up too quickly and I'm forced to sack my Barboach and my Vivian. Bryxen barely finishes it off and I reluctantly take my first Gym Badge. Losing Pokemon in the Nuzlocke before you even have a single badge always feels terrible, so I wasn't sure how hopeful I was for the remainder of this run. I decided to keep pressing forward since it was my first attempt after all, and on the bright side, I get to evolve two of my Pokemon and catch a Flabebe that I can also evolve. I overlevel most of the trainers on this next route so I can speed through them pretty easily and visit Lumio City. After spending some time getting roasted by my chat for picking a garbage outfit, even though I thought it looked pretty cool, I go to meet Professor Sycamore. In the original game, Professor Sycamore offers the player one of the three Kanto starters. In Ancestral X, however, he offers a Hoenn starter, and I decide to choose Grovile as Sceptile seemed insane in this game, with its mecha getting Technician and Dual Drop. Honestly, I think my favorite part of the Gen 6 games is the amount of customization options they give you for your character. Like, I spent a solid amount of time changing my hairstyle and picking a cool outfit. Like, I don't know, Game Freak seriously needs to bring this kind of stuff back in the future. After spending way too long customizing my character, I finally continued to play the game and was met with one of the most horrific sights I've ever seen in my life. I love Esper as much as the next quirky teenager that plays the trumpet, but seeing five of them stance the f up is kind of horrifying. I catch the male one as male Meowstic gets Prankster and evolve it immediately. On Route 5, there's this pretty scary double battle with a Plusle and a Minin that I almost lost a Pokemon to but somehow pulled through. One of the cool parts about Ancestral X is that Tierno and Trevor, f these characters by the way, actually have solid teams. Like why the hell does Tierno only have one level 12 core fish in this fight in the original games? Having multiple rivals that are all thought provoking fights is really cool and it's pretty unique to generation 6 hacks. I like how Tierno still has a lot of the core of his team, and even though this fight wasn't particularly hard, it was a huge upside compared to Vanilla X. I progress through the story where I'm told to go to this mansion, and on the way there I catch a Venipede. 
Speed Boost Scallopede is really exciting, and I immediately evolve it into a Whirlipede. I actually chased down this Furfru pretty quickly, which is shocking since children's puzzles are often way too hard for me, so I was feeling pretty good about the rest of this run. I catch a Feebass, which is awesome, considering my load against the Fairy typing in this game. I also continue towards Route 7 and catch the Snorlax that's sitting there, which is another insane encounter. A couple trainers later, and I met with our first tag battle of the game. Callum and I take on Trevor and Tierno, and as per usual in tag battles, my partner does virtually nothing. I actually didn't know I was able to bring a full team of 6 to this fight, and I thought I was only able to bring 3. So my plan kinda sucked, and I had some Pokemon in my party that were not prepared for this. I pretty quickly end up in a 2v1, and Trevor's Floette starts to set up Calm Minds. I eventually take out all of Tierno's Pokemon, but Trevor's Floette is a threat. This thing is gonna sweep the rest of my team if I'm not careful, and I choose to send in Meowstic to fight it. I land a Psybeam Confusion, which was pretty huge. It hurts itself with Confusion not once, not twice, but three times, and I somehow take down that demon. Trevor's Wartortle and Raichu are much easier, and I make it through the fight deathless. I grab a Tyrogue as my encounter, and after another pretty scary double battle where I didn't notice Sunny Day, my Whirlipede evolves into Scallopede. On the other side of the cave, I evolve my Tyrogue into Hitmontop, and pick up a moderately disappointing Spoink as my encounter. On Route 9, I catch a much needed Helioptile and a Lunatone in Glittering Cave. In the depths of Glittering Cave, Team Flare is up to some mischief, huh? and I'm forced to beat their ass. The first few grunts are light work, but at the end is another tag battle with Callum against two more Flare members. These teams are decently scary, and both Coppergrigus and Garbodor getting the steel typings makes them a lot more interesting to prep for. This fight wasn't too bad for me and Callum, and afterwards we rescued the scientist who didn't seem to even know what was happening. He gives me a jaw fossil, which I revived into a Tyrant in Ambrette Town. Oh, and I went back and traded my Lanoon for Vesuvius, the Nummel. Our next task was to obtain the second gym badge after defeating Grant. I found a Binacle after smashing a rock hoping to get a Krabby since I figured that would help a lot for the rock type gym leader. Grant's team is actually really scary at first glance and doesn't get much easier in the actual fight. A double battle in the second gym with an Aerodactyl, Tyrantrum, and Gigalith, not to mention this Giga buffed Corsola. At this point I had evolved a few more of my Pokemon and started to prep for Grant. Grant leads with Corsola and Gigalith. I figured the Gigalith wanted to set up Stealth Rocks and Sceptile was supposed to Oko the Corsola. Hitmontop landed the Fake Out on the Giga Boulder and in came Tyrantrum. The calculator I was using actually lied to me and said my Hitmontop Oko'd Tyrantrum with Triple Kick, but I ended up leaving it with a sliver of HP. Not to mention my Hitmontop got targeted after I expected it to go for Sceptile. This wasn't going according to plan at all and I had to improvise. Sceptile knocks out the dinosaur with a Leaf Blade as Hitmontop goes for a Protect, and Jigglyth sends a Power Gem Sceptile's way. Once again, everything started to spiral turn after turn and I had to start improvising on the spot if I wanted to make it out of this fight alive. Aerodactyl gets brought in next and sees a KO on both of my Pokemon. I protect with Sceptile this time and switch Dr. Bust down into Barbarical. They both take the bait and fire into Seppi and things start to look a little better for now. I have Snorlax take the incoming attack since he was the only one who could safely as Barbarical knocked out the Aerodactyl. I'm losing a lot of HP too quickly and things are still looking pretty rough. Cradle is next and sees an easy Giga Drain at the Barbarical. I decide to double switch my Snorlax into Camerupt and Barbarical into Toxicroak. What happens next is actually disastrous and a little bit hilarious. Since Vesuvius was obtained through a trade, I went ahead and changed its trainer ID ahead of the fight to match mine so it would obey me despite being at too high of a level. However, apparently there's what's called a trainer ID and a secret ID. And I have to change both? But I didn't? And due to this fatal mistake, I lose both Vesuvius and Toxicroak. Absolutely devastating. Thankfully, from here, Sceptile and the Doctor can clean up, but four deaths after two gyms doesn't make me the happiest. Two badges, but at a cost. On the bright side, I get to evolve a few more Pokemon as the level cap keeps increasing. There's a few trainers on Route 10, including Team Flare's very own Frankie, whose Houndoom is a bit of a threat, but we can take it out with relative ease. As for my encounter, I rolled Cast Form, which isn't good. In Geosenge Town, Karina uses her elite team of two Lucarios to battle me, which is pretty free as expected. I find a Dedenne on Route 11, and what awaits me is one of the toughest sections of the game at this point. Reflection Cave is home to a bunch of incredibly scary trainers, including this Hustle Lanoon that set up Home Claws and immediately claimed my Dedenne. In the lower floor, I catch a Magnemite who I immediately evolved into a Magnezone, which is an awesome encounter. At the end of Reflection Cave are two really scary double battles, both with brutal teams. I made a huge misplay and ended up losing my Altaria to Monique's Gramble, which was honestly a devastating loss. Dragon and Fairy type Altaria has been really valuable and going forward without it is going to be pretty tough. After escaping the living hell that is Reflection Cave, Callum awaits me in the Tower of Mastery for our first battle against just him. He leads with Meowstic and I lead with Scallopede. 
A U-turn knocks it out, and I send out Delphox. Absol comes into counter, and I use my Lodic and him on top to take care of it. My newly acquired Magnezone is a solid check to the Altaria, and a combination of Delphox and Scallopede knock out the Clefable. Heliolisk was supposed to take care of the Greninja, but an extra sensory flinch ruins that plan, and I'm forced to send out my Milotic on a Water Shuriken. Heliolisk had Dry Skin, so I'm not entirely sure why I used that, but alright I guess. My Lodic finishes it off, and all that's left is Calum's Jolteon. I use Hitmontop and Scallopede's remaining HP to tag team it, and successfully beat Calum despite my bleeding box, and now overleveled my Lodic. I also picked up the most useful encounter yet, an Octillery. Despite our bleeding box, Karenna is surprisingly really simple. Her team might look scary, but I have a ton of Psychic and Fairy type Pokemon to take care of her. Her lead Zangoose is actually a fighting type in this game, but it gets completely obliterated by Lunatone, it doesn't have time to set up its burn. Pangoro is next, and Hitmontop counters it expertly. Karenna sends in Medicham, who chunks himself to half after a failed Hydrum kick, and I switch to Meowstic for the same plan. Medicham falls to itself, and Hitmontop is sent in for a Sucker Punch. Florges, again, counters this perfectly, baiting in Lucario for a steel move. Delphox beats this thing since it's the best starter in the game, and her last mod comes in. I pivot through Heliolisk and into Meowstic to pick up the last kill, and our easiest gym leader so far is taken care of. After stealing her badge, Karenna battles us in a Lucario mirror match, and after winning due to being the GOAT, she gifts us a Lucario. This thing's absurd, especially since I'm now able to Mega Evolve. I travel through Route 12 where this guy randomly gives me a whole ass Lapras. I don't question it and keep exploring the route, and narrowly beat another scary double battle. Kumarine City, home to some of the best music in the Pokemon series, is our next stop, and the plan is Shrimple. Get more Gym Badge. Before doing that though, I have to fight Calum again, although this time he has a Mega Altaria. I have pretty solid counters to all of his Pokemon, and he decides to throw by spamming Dragon Dance against my speed boosting Scallopede. I don't know, this fight was just pretty free for the most part. Our next stop is Gym Leader Ramos. After beating all of his Gym Trainers without losing a single Pokemon, including the Cast Form that I never had in the first place. Don't cry me. WHAT?! I DIDN'T EVEN CRIT ME! I start prepping for this battle. Mega Venusaur is a threat, but outside of that, this fight is pretty easy for me. Scallopede leads and takes out the Meganium, sending in Tropius. I use Tyrantrum to beat this thing, and her biggest problem comes in next, Torterra. This thing isn't actually a huge issue, I'm just a little worried about it setting up Stealth Rocks. Although, I guess I kind of overestimated how much of a problem that would be since they didn't end up really mattering a whole lot. I use Mega Sceptile to take care of the Tortoise, bringing in Ludicolo for an Ice move. A few pivots between Lapras, Seppi, and Scallopede chip it low enough for Scallopede to knock it out. Rotom Mo easily folds to Magnezone and Mega Venusaur's last. This thing also folds to Giga Chad Grumpig, and the old man falls. Four badges on attempt one despite all of the early game deaths was pretty exciting for me, but the next part of the game was probably the hardest so far. After getting the plant badge, I backtrack a bit to pick up a few more encounters. I take an Arkin and a Zerbe and an Omanite in Sea Spirit's Den. I also got a Macargo as my encounter on Route 13, which I wasn't too upset about. Frankie's back and he's guarding the entrance to the power plant. This time though, he has a Mega Houndoom that I greatly underestimated. As is the theme with this run, I end up having to sack my Amistar to this thing after it set up a nasty plot. I start to clear through the Flare Grunts that are stationed in the power plant after encountering a Pawniard Horde, and I evolve it into a Bisharp. The next two fights are just downright insane. Two double battles, one with a no-named Team Flare admin, and one with Aliana. These two fights are obviously scary, as one has a Zapdos and the other has a Raikou. Not to mention the rest of the Pokemon making up these teams, including Mega Gengar and Mega Banet. I lead with Delphox and Mega Lucario, sending an Aurora Beam into Gliscor and a Meteor Mash into Sylveon. In comes Zapdos and Typhlosion, who's holding a Choice Specs. I protect on both of my Mons to scout Typhlosion's move choice, and it goes for Earth Power, which is exactly what I wanted. I switch into Lunatone and Archaeops, who are both immune to ground moves. I figured since Typhlosion was useless at this point, that it would probably switch out, and it does exactly that into Scizor, who eats a Discharge from its own teammate as Lunatone breaks the Zapdos' Charty Berry with a Power Gem. Expecting a Discharge, I switch into both of my leads, who both get paralyzed. Lucario switches out for Bisharp, and Delphox gets fully paralyzed, putting me in a horrible spot. After protecting Bisharp, Delphox launches a Flamethrower into the Scizor, and brings Typhlosion back in. Thankfully, it used Earth Power again, and Lunatone and Archaeops come back in perfectly. The same as before, I predict the switch and Gengar eats an Earth Power. Archaeops outspeeds and knocks down the Zapdos now that its berry is gone, and all that's left is a weakened Mega Gengar and the same Typhlosion. I'm forced to chance it since Typhlosion sees a kill on both Archaeops and Lunatone, and switch Lunatone out into Tyrantrum. This works exactly according to plan, and as Archaeops takes out the Gengar, Typhlosion sends a Flash Cannon into my incoming Tyrantrum. Since it's the last remaining Pokemon and can only use Flash Cannon, I send in two Steel Resists and finish it off, narrowly escaping this insanely difficult fight with no deaths. 
Unfortunately, there is practically no break since I immediately have to prepare for a potential disaster. Aliana's team is crazy and even harder than the previous fight. It starts off fine as Scallopede kills the Whimsicott and Meowstic fake out to the Behem. Flygon comes in and sees an easy kill on Meowstic with Bug Buzz. Scallopede U-turns the Behem, taking it out as I switch into Archaeops on the incoming Bug Buzz. I massively underestimated how much damage this would do and totally forgot that this thing had Tinted Lens, but Archaeops takes it like a champ and holds on. Feral Agator comes in and both opposing Pokemon see a kill on both of the Pokemon on my side. I decide to switch Archaeops into Scallopede and protect with Meowstic, and the AI does the unthinkable. Flygon clicks Quiver Dance and Feral Agator clicks Dragon Dance. I have no idea why this happened, like they both saw that they could kill both of my Pokemon but used setup moves anyway? From here, everything crumbled and I get completely overwhelmed by the Flygon. Eventually, all six of my Pokemon faint and attempt one of Ancestral X comes to an end. This game's actually extremely fun, and it offers a fresh take on Generation 6 while adding some of the difficulty that makes me love Nuzlocke in games like this. My biggest complaint with this game was the AI being a little bit inconsistent, especially in double battles, as you saw with both Pokemon setting up despite seeing a kill. The creator, Axon, actually put out a patch very recently that adds a bunch of AI changes that hopefully makes the game feel even better. I highly recommend giving this game a shot. It's probably the best Generation 6 hack out there right now. If you liked the video, consider dropping a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. It allows me to keep making more content like this. And as always, I stream almost every single day over on Twitch. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.